the divided kingdom. Uh, wait, wait, wait. A point that I should have made in the beginning was a hey, Jeroboam and Rehoboam were brothers. When the kingdom split, the north end of the kingdom wanted Rehoboam as their leader. The south end of the kingdom wanted Jeroboam as their leader, and that's what caused the place to split. The country to split. The kingdom was split. So you have two kings now. You had King Rehoboam in the north, King Jeroboam in the south. So when you read through the book of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, okay, Kings, the book of Kings pretty much follows the line of the north, I believe. And Chronicles covers the line of the south kings. There's a lot of repeat in there. So as you read through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you go, well, I read about this guy already in over here. It repeats itself, but one focuses more on the north, the other focuses more on the south. Okay. And they lived in their sinful state of debauchery for about 400 years. Debauchery. In other words, sinful, sinful behavior. They followed idolatry. They started doing things like the nations all around them would do. And as they did that, the nation of Israel went from the most powerful country on the face of the earth under Solomon. It was the greatest country on the face of the earth when Solomon reigned. It went from there, within 400 years, it was decimated. Because the people forsake, forsook the Lord God and moved on their own direction. What word did you say it was the what nation? Oh, the nation of Israel was the greatest nation on the face of the earth under the rule of Solomon. Leaders from everywhere else in the world would come to Jerusalem to just see the gardens that he did, in, the temple that he built. Under the rule of Solomon, he built the temple. He established trade with countries all around. He grew his army. And he prospered the nation. When, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. When the kingdom split, Jerusalem became the capital of the south. He prospered the nation through the international trade that he set up with all the countries all around. He did commerce with the Asian com countries, uh, countries in Africa, and all countries of the world at that time wanted to do business with the nation of Israel. And that's what happens when God is the centerpiece of your economy. Things start to go good for you. Yes? So, the first, though, you said Jeroboam followed God. Did he, when it split, did he stop doing that? When the nation of Israel split, he still continued, to, Jeroboam still continued to follow God. Rehoboam did not. Yeah. Yes. And so, whenever you see a king sinning, they say, just like the deeds that Rehoboam did. I'm sorry? Or... Or yes, or just like Jeroboam did basically as they did right in the eyes of the Lord, or they did not do right in the eyes of the Lord. That's how it's broken down in first Kings, or first second Kings, first second Thank you. Capital of the south was Jerusalem. Capital of the north was Samaria. Samaria. Capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. You might recognize Samaritans in Scripture. We will get to the importance of that term here in a little bit. Okay. And, and the capital of the south was Jerusalem. Capital of the south was Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. Samaria did not have a temple because they followed idolatry. 
Yes, they did. Yes. So for 400 years, the nation of Israel, they even battled against each other. They had wars with each other. Brother against brother. The nation of the north invaded the south. The south invaded the north. They would fight back and forth. It was a civil war. Yeah, I was going to say, the first civil war. Yeah, pretty much it was a civil war. And finally, in 734 BCE, the Assyrians started coming and taking the North Kingdom into captivity. The Assyrians, yes. The Assyrians. A S S Y? Yes. Yeah, it was the Assyrians starting in 734. For 10 years to 724 BCE, started taking Jewish northern people into their culture, and their mindset was, we are going to obliterate the nation of Israel. We're going to make them no more. All through Scripture, you will find that the enemy uses two ways to conquer. He either wants to win you over or wipe you out. Win you over or wipe you out. And that's what he did with the nation of Israel. The northern kingdom, what they did was the Assyrians went in and they said, the nation of Israel is going to be no more. So they took these captives and they brought them back to their land of Assyria and then they dispersed them all throughout the northern countries and they forced them to marry, intermarry, so that would basically wipe out the bloodline. You had some that stayed true to their bloodline, but for, for the most part, a Jewish woman was matched up with an Assyrian man and then they would become a half-breed. And then that half-breed would then be matched up with another half-breed and over the course of time, that bloodline would be diluted. That's where Esther comes involved. The story of Esther. Esther was queen of one of the Assyrian countries, and she had heard a plot by a ruler in that country, Haman, to wipe out anybody who was a Jew, not knowing that Esther was a Jew herself. So Esther played a very important role in preserving the line of the Jewish people in the Assyrian nations. Does that answer your question on, on Esther? Preserve the line of the Jewish nation in the Assyrian countries. No, that wasn't Okay, because I know you, you had mentioned Esther previously. If she was the one that the books of the Bible or the... A historical book. She's a historical book, but her theater was in a Assyrian country. Today, we are seeing, actually from, from, from since 1948 till the present day, we are seeing a huge number of half-breed, if you want to call them, return back to the land of Israel. They're coming back. And prophecy had said that. They're going to return. We're now seeing that today from the northern countries north of if, to their homeland, yes. That portion marks pretty much the end of the northern kingdom of the land of Israel. After that time, it was strictly the land of Judah is what it was called. The northern kingdom was gone. Samaria 
was no longer the capital, but it became a hangout for the half-breeds. So in, New in Jesus' day, you had animosity between the true Jews in the land of Judah and the half-breeds in the land of Samaria. They didn't like each other at all. And they, they didn't hide that fact. They, they had their discrimination issues. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. In fact, if a Jewish person had to travel to a point on the other side of Samaria, they would go around the country. They wouldn't go through it. That's how much they did not want to be a part. So when Jesus was in Samaria, I'm sorry? They were considered unclean because they were half-breeds. So when Jesus goes into Samaria, they're freaking out. What's the guy Jesus going to do in here? Why is he coming to Samaria? So we have the end of the Northern Kingdom at about 700 B.C. In 604, Uh, in uh, about seven, about 724, 724 BC was the last deportation of Israel, Israelites of the Northern Kingdom to Assyria. In 724 BCE, that's the last recorded exile of Northern Israel tribes to Assyria. And that's pretty much the end of the Northern Kingdom. That's to exile of... The Northern tribes to Assyria. In the south, from 604 to 586 BC, there was two exiles of Babylon. What Babylon did, they went differently. They didn't go take the Jews and incorporate them into their society and then just kind of disperse them. They, for some reason, they decided they were going to hang on to them as a people. Jeff? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, your face is red. <laughs> okay, so 604 was the first <clears throat> deportation, or the first, and then 586 was the second and largest. And in that, to Babylon. Daniel was part of that group, and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were exiled to Babylon. What was left in the land of Egypt, Babylon didn't take everybody. They kind of pick and choose. They got the young, they got the smart, and they got the people that kind of had some gumption about them. They left behind the peasant farmers. They left behind the street people. They left behind the people that they thought would have no worth in society to just kind of fend for themselves and live on their own in the land of Judah. So this remnant of Israel that it was in Babylon, they were there for 70 years. Okay, so 70 years in Babylon. Yes. And that's where we read about Daniel and him growing up in Babylon and going through the things that he did and making friends with three different Babylonian kings. No. Uh, no, the other way, the other way around. I thought. Okay. 
That's how I referred them to. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, anyway, find that for me if you could, please. Thank you. Okay, can, can I? Uh, last recorded exiles of the northern tribes to Assyria, 604 was the first portion. 685 BC was the last people. 586. Kings while in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, and I forgot the third one. I have to look that up. But anyway, three different kings that he s stayed under. And he influenced those kings. After 70 years, oh, by the way, about uh, estimated anywhere between, well, they estimated about, yes. Thank you. Those were their Jewish names, but she just rattled off. I gave you their Babylonian changed names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who what? Daniel. Yeah, Belted, yes. That was that was a Babylonian name. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, records show that um, about 3,500 men were exiled into the land of Babylon. So you got to figure probably about 10 to 12,000 people were taken from the southern, southern tribe into Babylon. And they also estimate those 10 to 12,000 people was an eighth of the original number of people living in the south. So that means seven-eighths of the population was wiped out for the most part. Of uh, the southern tribes. Seven eighths. Approximately. Seven-eighths of, of the southern civilizations were, were gone. The Babylonians. They did the Babylonians did the south. The Assyrians did the north. When the nation of Israel came out of Babylon seventy years later, with women and children, they estimate about one hundred and ten thousand. So while they were in Babylon, God prospered them, and that's the same for us today. When we are in that time of trial, God puts us there, he takes care of us and a lot of times prospers us in that. In that. So if you're in the middle of something, God hasn't left you there to wither. He's taking care of you. In fact, they, when they left, there was a, about 110, they figure, along with slaves and animals. So they had to be property owners. So they were pretty wealthy people coming out of that one. So they went, they returned to Jerusalem in 537 BC. Same thing. They returned to Jerusalem 537 BCE or BC. One of the two, take a pick. And there they rebuilt the walls under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. They rebuilt the city walls. They rebuilt the temple. They reestablished the sacrificial system. And they reestablished the law that was given to Moses in the wilderness. They reestablished the sacrificial system. 
and the law. Now something interesting to keep in mind, before the nation of Israel, the southern nation, was exiled, the spirit and presence of God left the temple. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11. Yes. Before the Babylonian exile of the south, the presence of God left the temple that Solomon had built. And that's in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11. And this is very important because when the temple is rebuilt, between 537 and 400 BC, or BCE, the Spirit of God does not re-enter into the temple. Four hundred. The, the temple, when the temple was rebuilt, the Spirit of God did not re-enter into the temple. of the temple in, uh, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> of the rebuilding? Yeah. 537 to 400, approximately. Oh, okay. So, that was kind of a precursor to empty worship that the Jewish people were doing at the time of Christ when he showed up. And for 400 years, there was a time of silence where God did not speak to his people or any people through the prophets. There was a 400 year gap of silence. 400 years of silence. The Jews reestablished what they thought they were supposed to do. And so in their mind, we're doing what we're supposed to do. But that's also where the Pharisees kind of got their fuel for what they were doing. Because they, they're zealots and they realized, we blew it back over here, so we're not going to do that again. So we're going to keep this. And then that's where it comes to the line upon line, precept upon precept, law upon law, because they wanted to make sure everything got perfect or they're going to get spanked again. And they didn't want that to happen. That's during those 400 years. That's, yes, that's the beginning of your, of, of your zealots starting to come up. We don't want to go through that again. But the Spirit of God was not there with them. So far, so good? Okay. Moving ahead to approximately 4 BC. Now, this, I'm going to write some dates down, and I challenge you to be researchers. Look it up. These are not set in stone. This is from the research that I've done. But please feel free to research on your own and see if you can come up with what I came up with or somewhere close by. Okay. Excuse my Chinese chicken scratch. That's exactly what it looks like. Birth of Christ. Somewhere between 4 and 6 BCE. My own personal opinion, based on what I've studied, 
Again, I could be completely wrong. Beginning of October of four. Puzzle pieces are there in scripture. Talks to who's ruling, who is in power, who is king. Gives you those clues, those hints. Early October 4 BC, during my, again, this is based on what I've come up with and kind of interjecting my study, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles on 4 BC, when Jesus came to tabernacle with us. Scripture says, back in the law, that three times a year, all men were to come to Jerusalem and bring themselves before the Lord in the temple. That's what the Jews did. Now remember when I had said earlier when we were about crossing the Jordan, it was during the flood stage, it was during that harvest time. That was the first harvest. There's two harvests a year. Feast of Tabernacles is about the second time, the second harvest during the year. The nation of Israel being a agricultural society, they didn't get paid every Friday. They didn't get paid every other Friday. They got paid when the crops got sold. They got paid at harvest time. So when Tiberius said, hey, the world needs to be taxed, why did the world need to be taxed? The Roman Empire was growing and they needed funds to continue its growth. And when it says the world, it was all about Rome. So when you, when in that time, in this time of, of history, when you say the whole world should be taxed, they're talking about the Roman Empire. Because to them, we're, we are the world. Okay, that's it. Not just us. It's all about us. But that's not the Romans thought. Okay. So, Tiberius said, you know what? We want our cut of your payday. So yeah, you're going to register and you're going to pay tax on your way to Jerusalem because you're going to have a bag of money going to Jerusalem because scripture says every man present himself for the Lord and do not come empty handed that's in uh, Deuteronomy is that where that saying never go to someone's house empty handed comes from that could well that could be I don't know I thought it's been ingrained in me since I was a child through my mother so when you come to my house <laughs> as soon as you tell me where you live, I got a car down. <laughs> yeah. You live in South Salem somewhere, right? I do, yes. I yeah. South Salem. yeah, we're in South Salem. So, yeah. You're yeah, probably neighbors. You're probably. <laughs> so, again, my guesstimation is during the Future Tabernacles, that's why the inn was crowded and full of people, because they all had to show up in that area. And Bethlehem isn't too far from Jerusalem. So they show up. Again, this is something that, research it. You might come up with something completely different, which is fine. But it's kind of fun to dive in and dig in and go, ooh, hey, the backside of the story is this. Okay? So that's the first date. The life of Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Jesus was approximately 30 years old, Scripture says, when he started his earthly ministry. Now, theologians are divided on how long that earthly ministry is, and they base that time frame on the number of times Passover is mentioned in the New Testament. Some say that he had three Passovers, including the one that he was crucified on. Others say, no, it's just one. So some theologians will say his earthly ministry is about a year, year and a half, to three years, somewhere in there. We are clear, it says John starts baptizing, who baptized Jesus Christ, in the 15th year of the reign of, what's his name? A ruler. You could look that up when you were researching John the Baptist. He started baptizing in the 15th year of this guy's reign, and so Jesus Christ was part of that baptism. Okay. Okay, that's our homework. Yeah. No, I, I did not say homework. I said, you can look it up. In other words, I'm challenging. Yeah, Dr. McLeod did the same thing. Oh, yeah, here's some homework for you. That, he wasn't saying this is your assigned homework. He was saying, you know what? 
Look this up. Check it out. That would be some homework for you to do. Not, this is the assigned homework, turn it in. That's why you have all that stuff. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Death of Christ, according to my calculations, a Wednesday crucifixion. Yes, a Wednesday crucifixion. Here's why. When Jesus was on the earth, he said, just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, just like Lazarus was in the tomb three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in three days and three nights. Key, key point. Very, very important. The Jewish calendar starts at 6 o'clock p.m. Sunset. So at sunset is when the next day starts. Not at midnight like the Roman calendar. Very, very important. Okay, so, so that more time, the Jewish calendar starts... Jewish calendar starts at 6 p.m. or sunset. Okay? There's that twilight in there. They give themselves, they fudge a little bit in there. But pretty much 6, 6 o'clock or sunset on the day, that's the beginning of the next day. And it goes from sunset to sunset. Yes. Evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. Genesis chapter 1 talks about that. So, what do you think about what time did Christ die? Because it says at noon, and I thought it said at noon. It says the third hour. Okay. Which at 9 o'clock is when he was hoisted up on the cross. And he was on the cross until the, until the ninth hour, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Because what they'll do is they'll say, okay, at sunrise, that's the first hour of light. The third hour of light is 9 o'clock. The sixth hour of light is 3 o'clock. Okay. And that's and, and due to the fact that Israel is pretty close to the equator, you're not going to have a huge, not like Alaska, where you've got vast, even here in Oregon, okay, the nation of Israel is pretty close to the center, that center belt, so you're not going to have a really big time variation. Okay. So Jesus Christ was placed on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday, April 28, 28 A.D., or C.E., however you want to put it, 28th. And again, this is based on the research that I've done. The reason why it's Wednesday is A, three days, three nights. Some people say Thursday. But it couldn't have been Thursday, and I'll explain that in a second. So, 28. April 28, 28. AD. Or, or CE, either way. Okay, so, Jesus Christ was crucified on Passover, which is the 14th day of Nisan. Always a full moon. 14th day of the month of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, always a full moon. And that's the day he was crucified. So at 6 o'clock, the 28th start, or yeah, the 28th started. That's when he had dinner with his disciples. After dinner, sun went down, we're on the 28th. They go out the back door of the gate, they go down across the Kindred Valley, they go to the Mount of Olives. At night, an illegal trial happens, because the law stated you have to have it during the day, you can't have it at night. Okay. We're now on the 28th, because it started at sunset. They've had their Passover meal. Jesus is arrested. He's then tried, beaten. Early in the morning, he's brought before Pilate. Still on the 28th, Pilate then sentences, sentences him to death. 
that he's brought, again, beaten, flogged, put up on a cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when he says it is finished. We're still on the 28th. Now, the day after Passover is another feast. It's called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And that's the day of preparation for that is the day after Passover, on the 15th day of Nisan. And the 15th day of Nisan is considered a high Sabbath. And the scripture says, do no work. So they couldn't do anything. 15th day of Nisan is the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. We good so far? Okay. So, they, had, they were to do no work. That's why Jesus had to be off of the cross before sundown. Because they had to get him off the cross and into the ground. Because if they touched him after sundown, they would be unclean. And if you're unclean as a Jew, you had to go outside the camp for seven days. And he was the feast. So Jewish law said, we got to get him down. we got to get him on the ground. Before sunset. Okay? So that's the 28th. Okay? So he's in the ground. 29th. Evening. The evening. So that's, that's Thursday. The 30th. That's Friday. Saturday. 31st. Then at 6 p.m. the next day, Sunday morning, is when he rises. He's not seen until probably sunrise of Sunday morning, but then we're already into Sunday. Follow? Are we tracking? Okay. Now the reason why 